All right. Getting ready to get started, and away we go. I believe that we are live. Let me know if you can see me and hear me down in the chat block uh, chat box. I am using a totally new streaming software, so hopefully everything's coming through. Uh, if you're catching this live, let me know. If you're catching this in the future, hello, person from the future, we're going to go into compression controls today, and specifically the weird compression controls that you never really figured out how to use. If you're anything like me, you might have been doing audio for literally years before you figured out what some of these compression controls really do, and even more importantly than that, like how or why you'd actually use them. So I want you to be honest with me in the comments and in the chat box if you're on the live stream version of this. Do you know what the knee control does on your compressor? And if so, you have this theoretical knowledge of what it does, like do you really have a sense of how and why you'd use it and like why would that at all inform your compression decisions? Knee isn't the only thing we're going to be talking about today. We've got a whole bunch of other ideas, some really simple ones like how to think about using the compressor link function, how about using side chains and key inputs. Then we'll get into some esoteric stuff like feed forward and feedback. Ah, if all that doesn't make sense to you, we're going to make it super duper simple. And you're going to come away knowing how to use like all of the odd controls that almost no one teaches you in the basic walkthroughs of how to use a compressor. You're going to know these things inside and out, and you're going to walk away feeling like a compressor expert. Honestly, even if you don't know how to use a compressor at all at this point, I will start out just by going over the super basic controls on a compressor so we're all caught up with what attack, release, ratio, and threshold are. We'll spend just a minute or two on that, and then we will get deep into the more esoteric stuff. If you want to go super deep with me, I do have a full-length course that's just on compression. It's called Compression Breakthroughs. You can get over at compressionbreakthroughs.com. And in there, we go for hours on how to learn to hear compression, use it, understand it. And I think that's one of the big things is really learning to hear compression and having a strategy for how to apply it. And in that course, I also give you insights on how to use compression on literally every single kind of instrument, every single kind of genre. But enough about that stuff. Let's get into some good free content before we get into the controls, the weird ones that you've never really learned how to use. Let's just make sure that you are caught up with the basic controls in the compressor. This will be a refresher for some of you, and for some of you, these basic controls might be more advanced. All right, our basic controls in the compressor, I would consider attack, release, threshold, ratio. Quick recap there. Threshold is the point at which the compressor kicks in. If something gets louder than the threshold, it gets compressed. If something's quieter than the threshold, it doesn't get compressed. Ratio is how much we're compressing signals that get above the threshold. So if something gets above the threshold by 4 dB and is being compressed at a 4 to 1 ratio, instead of going 4 dB above the threshold, it's only going to be allowed to go 1 dB above the threshold. So that's the ratio. Once the compressor kicks in, how much is it compressing? We also have our attack and release, which you can think about kind of in layman's terms as the attack being how quickly the compressor kicks in. So if you have a really, really fast attack time, the compressor kicks in really, really fast. It might shave off some of your transients. If you have a really, really slow attack time, it might let more of the initial transient impact through. Same idea with the release. You can think of it being how quickly the compressor lets go after it starts compressing. And if you've got a fast release, it's going to let go fast, which will bring up sustain generally. And if you've got a slow release, it'll let go more slowly. And that's actually going to bring down your sustain. Some people get that idea backwards. We could go into so much detail where I slow down and walk you through each of those. I do that in the course and I do it on a bunch of other free videos right here in this channel. But I'm going to assume that if you got this far, you understand those basic compression controls, but you might not understand some of our more advanced ones. And don't worry, we are going to have some visual aids here today. So let me see if I can switch. This is new technology for me, sharing my Pro Tools screen. Let me know in the chat box if you can see my Pro Tools screen. And if you're on the audio-only version of the podcast, don't worry. We're going to walk through this stuff in verbal ways where you can follow along if you're on the audio-only podcast version. But for those of you who are watching video, let's take advantage of the fact that we have video and we can look at some of this stuff together. So the first big control that I want to hip you to 
is me and how this really works. I theoretically knew what me was and what it did to audio ages ago. But did I really know? Did I really internalize it? I don't think so. And I think I have a much easier way to describe to you what the knee is really doing in your compressor, how to use it, and how to let it inform your choices even when you're using a compressor that doesn't have a knee control on it. Because even if your compressor doesn't have a knob on it that says knee, there is a knee in that compressor. And what that knee is like, to some degree, shapes the tone and response of the compressor. So for those of you who are watching the video version of this, you'll see that as I turn this knee knob, the little curve on this compressor changes. And it changes right here where this orange line is. So this is why it's called knee. This almost looks like a bend in a joint here. But not all of you really know how to read one of these gain reduction graphs. On one side, you've got input in. One side, you've got resulting output out. You'll see that as I change the ratio, the line would change as well. But here's how I want you to think about what the knee is doing. When you have a soft knee, it basically takes your threshold, that point where the compressor starts kicking in, and instead of making it a hard and fast line, it turns it into a blurry line, a fuzzy line. I'm going to bring up some analogies here. I'm going to try to think of some on the spot. And here's what I've got for you on what the knee is like. The knee is like a hard knee would be like a nightclub bouncer who says you get into the nightclub or you don't. You, you're pretty, come in. You, you're ugly, you're not allowed in. And either that rope gets parted and you come into the nightclub and you're in the club or you're not. A really hard knee compressor basically says you get past this threshold, you're getting in. You're not past this threshold, no nightclub for you. You're not even allowed to put your ear up against the door and listen to the throbbing bass coming out of the club. No, you start doing that, we're going to take you out to the pavement. Man, I'm probably taking this bouncer analogy too far. But I think you get the idea. Hard knee means that that threshold is really serious about being a threshold. This is a line you do not cross. And if you cross it, then you're getting compressed. You don't cross it, you're not getting compressed. Whereas a soft knee is a little bit more like making that threshold line blurrier, fuzzier. Where as a signal starts to approach the threshold, it might start getting compressed before it even hits the nominal threshold. And then as it passes the threshold, it gets compressed a little bit more. And as it passes it further, it gets compressed potentially more still. And that's the way that a lot of softer knee compressors work. Basically, you pass the threshold, you're getting compressed a little bit. As you pass the threshold more, you're getting compressed more. It's almost like having a variable ratio. At least that's the way that I think is best to conceptualize and understand it. And it also has an effect on changing the way that your attack and release time feel. And I'll get into that in just a second and how you can use this to greater tonal effect. But to use one of these analogies again, the soft ratio would be a bit like the coach of like a youth soccer league where everyone gets a trophy or at least a ribbon. And it's like, maybe you were the best player on the team, so you get the biggest trophy. But come on, we're all going to get a little bit of a trophy. As long as you actually showed up and tried, you'll get a ribbon, you'll get something. Maybe you ran the fastest 100-meter dash, and you're going to get the biggest trophy because you got the furthest past the threshold. But those of you who got, you got pretty close to the threshold, you deserve a runner-up prize. And that's kind of what a softer knee is like. You get past the threshold, you're getting compressed. How much? Eh, a little bit. You get past it more, you're getting compressed more. And in some compressor designs, you could say, as you're approaching the threshold, we're starting to get compressed before we even hit that point that you might consider the threshold. It's like, eh, what's the threshold among friends? You came pretty close. You get a little bit of compression for you. The hard knee, it's like, nope, you didn't pass the threshold. No compression for you. So that's the general idea. And I hope that conceptualizes it better than just looking at this knee on this graph here.
Now, what are the real world effects of that tonally? By the way, let me know how these analogies are working for you. So what are the real world effects of this tonally? Let me come back to my main screen. We'll talk about that a little bit. So when it comes to your attack and release, they're going to be more precise when you have a hard knee, firm threshold. But as your knee gets softer and softer, they're going to be a little less precise. And it has the effect of basically slowing down both your attack and your release. So at the same nominal setting, say you set a 10 millisecond attack time and a 80 millisecond release time, in effect, those attack and release times will get a little bit slower as the knee softens. And the effective ratio will get a little bit softer. Uh, yeah, a little bit gentler. The ratio will get a little bit lower as that knee softens. And as your knee gets harder, your attack and release get faster and more precise. And your ratio becomes more precise and it becomes closer to what your actual nominal ratio is. Now, I don't do a lot of audio examples on the podcast. It's a podcast. I expect that half the people listening to this are like driving in their cars and um, you know doing the dishes, mowing their lawn or something. But I will give in the background a little bit of an audio or at least visual example to those of you on the video version of this. And we'll just go back and forth as I'm talking about this, just looking at a snare on screen where here we are in one knee setting. This is the fast knee. And look at the gain reduction meter on this. We're getting something like, I'll adjust the threshold here, something like 6 to 10 dB of gain reduction. We got a 10 millisecond attack time, 80 millisecond release. As we back off on that knee, you'll see this gain reduction meter starts to act a little bit slower. It's kicking in a little bit more slowly and releasing a little bit more slowly. And here we go back to a hard knee. And you'll see that the color of the line has changed too. It's a darker orange because it's actually doing more maximum compression. It's getting close to 12 dB of compression here when we have the hard knee. But when we back off to the soft knee, it's getting maybe mm, 6 to 10 dB of compression. So generally speaking, a lot of your old school retro compressors are going to have softer knees. And a lot of your more modern compressors are going to have harder knees. VCA compressors, you can think of those as being harder knee compressors on average. Things like your SSL compressors and your API compressors. Whereas things like your opto compressors, your LA-2As, your Manly Varimuse, your Fairchild tube compressors, those things are generally going to be softer knee compressors. And an LA-2A opto compressor, maybe I'll bring up some more audio examples for those of you guys who are uh, watching this. Let me uh, bring up an opto compressor here. The Acme Audio Opticom is a really fun one uh, here. Looks a lot like a uh, LA-2A. A compressor like this might have a nominal attack time of something like 10 milliseconds, but that's a little bit dependent on the program material that's being fed into it. And it has a fixed attack time, old school compressor, but the effective attack time feels somewhat slower than it might otherwise be because of that softer knee. The same kind of thing happens with a tube compressor like a Fairchild. They actually have relatively fast attack times. Nominally, they're in the range of a millisecond or two, depending on which setting you have them in. But because they have a softer knee, they tend to act a little bit slower because the signal that has just gotten past the threshold a little bit isn't getting compressed as much as signals that have gotten way further through the threshold. So is the effect of slowing down our attack and release and lowering our ratio. So you're generally going to associate the sound of opto compressors, tube compressors with softer knees, and you're generally going to associate the sound of VCA compressors, more modern compressors with harder knees. But a lot of modern compressors do give you the ability to change between these two modes. Is the change of changing your knee really significant? Not always, no. 
In fact, in the Compression Breakthroughs course, where we do a lot of audio examples. You can hear a whole bunch of audio examples. And I didn't set up a whole bunch for today's podcast episode because it's a podcast. We don't do a lot of audio examples. And because to set up audio examples where I know you can really hear the changes in knee actually takes some doing because it can be kind of subtle. And here's the reality with a lot of these advanced controls that we're going to get to today. A lot of them can be a little bit subtle, but every once in a while, it can be just the right thing. So here's the way I want you to think about how to set your knee and how to use your knee. And then we'll go on to some other controls. Man, if this was some other channel, we would just like end this right after talking about knee for 15 minutes. We've learned everything possible about knee, but we're going to learn about this much, about all the other controls, although much faster as we go along uh, after I do this. And I'll probably excerpt out a section on knee. Hey, before I give you my last tasting notes, like how to actually use knee and how to think about like, okay, I got all the theory just and I understand better than ever how it works, but how am I going to apply that in my actual mixes and recordings? Um, that's a great question. And I'm going to answer it in a second. But before I do, let me know. I just want to let uh, to say to you, let me know as this episode goes along, if you have a eureka moment that really is a breakthrough moment for you, let me know because I love to excerpt those into shorts, one minute shorts, five minute shorts. So other people who don't want to watch or listen to a whole half an hour to hour long podcast episode can get some of the best key takeaways. And so that you in your travels on the YouTubes, on the Facebooks, on the Instagrams might get hit with some of these ideas another time. And uh, repetition is really how we learn to internalize these things. So if you have any breakthrough moments in this episode, please let me know. And I'll excerpt them for you. All right. Here's how to think about actually using the knee control. Um, I would say that the biggest thing is to think about whether you want your compressor to act more like an averaging compressor or more like a firm peak catching compressor. An averaging compressor, things that do that role are often things like the VCA compressors from, uh, sorry, yeah, averaging compressor would be things like opto compressors like LA-2As, where you're often taking things like vocals and bass, and you're maybe not obsessed with catching the peaks on them, and you just want to control the macro dynamics. Meanwhile, a compressor that you might use on things like drums or really erratic sounds where the dynamics are really uncontrolled, you might want to use a harder knee. So anything where you're going to veer towards going for faster attacks and ha higher ratios, that style of compression, you're often going to want to use hard, uh, higher knees, harder knees in those cases. Where when you're veering towards softer compression, more averaging compression, where you're not trying to catch peaks, and you're just trying to control more the macro dynamics and the micro dynamics, that's where you're looking more for softer knees. All right, getting on to our next big type of compressor control. That would be a feedback versus feed forward. And I want to front load this with some of the nerdiest stuff. Uh, for those of you who are watching the video version, I'll open up another plugin here that has this type of control on it. Look, it's actually got a knee control, soft, medium, and hard. There's a filter control on it. We'll talk a little bit more about filters as we go along. And this style control, feedback and feed forward. And feedback and feed forward are two different ways of your detector circuit to interact with your compressed signal. In a feedback compressor, we're taking the signal that has been compressed and feeding it back into the compressor's detector circuit. So the detector circuit, the thing that's telling the compressor how much to compress, it's listening to an already compressed signal. A feed-forward design is slightly different. Where the compressor compresses, and that compressed signal never goes back into the detector circuit. It just feeds forward into the world of your audio, and it does not get fed back into the detector circuit. And this means... Basically, an uncompressed signal is being fed back into your detector circuit. So all else being equal, when you have a compressor on feedback, it tends to be a little bit smoother and it's less likely to kind of overcompress or overreact to peaks that have already been compressed by the compressor. 
Whereas you put things in the feed forward mode and that compressor is going to tend to be a little bit more aggressive. It's going to clamp down on things a little bit harder. It might be a little bit less smooth in operation. So we're going to go faster and faster as this episode goes along. I think this concept may make sense to you already. I think it's been explained well enough. But how to actually use this idea of feedback versus feed forward compression when you're choosing compressor settings. Feedback compression settings, generally when you want to do less compression, more subtle compression, smoother compression, where you want to hear fewer compression artifacts, feedback is often the way to go because you're taking that already compressed signal, feeding it back into the detector circuit, so you're less likely to over compress and have a compressor that overreacts needlessly to signals it already reacted to. But if you want more significant compression, you want to clamp down on things even harder. You want to potentially have some extra pumping and breathing artifacts. You want that feeling of your compressor almost sucking down a lot on an initial hit. A feed forward mode will do more of that. And this becomes even more apparent, I think, as you play around with the release time on a compressor the difference between the feedback and the feed forward modes. And kind of as the release time gets a little bit longer, I think has an even bigger influence. So do you want to hear your compressor a little bit more? Do you want to do even more extreme dynamic control? Try feed forward. Do you want to be a little bit gentler and have fewer compression artifacts and be a little bit smoother in operation? Try out your feedback mode. All right, so that's control number two. At this point, I should probably tell you guys how many I have on my list so you know how many we're in store for. We're about 20 minutes into the episode. I've covered the first two. But as always, I front load these episodes like crazy and talk about the thing that I want to talk about the most in the beginning. So all of these are going to get so much faster as we go along. There are a total of nine on this list. We're about to get to number three, but it's going to go by as fast or faster than number two, as will all the others on this list. All right, let's check out now the next control, which we'll actually find on this very same compressor. And that is our link control. This one is a multiband compressor, so it has multiple link controls. But you'll see that a lot of modern compressors have link controls on them, and not just compressors. I first encountered links, stereo link controls, variable ones at least, on things like limiters. And this Isotope limiter here has a fully variable stereo independence control. On a lot of old school compressors and limiters, you would just have two modes. Either they'd be linked completely or they'd be completely unlinked. And this is really only relevant when we're talking about stereo compression and mid side compression. Let me take this uh, beautiful Pro Tools screen away for a second so I can talk to you guys in a little bit more detail about the concepts here. So, why link or unlink a stereo compressor or a mid-side compressor? And the idea here is, if you're compressing something that's stereo, say a mix bus, say a drum bus, you could have that stereo compressor be listening to, say, the average of the left and right signal and compressing both left and right together based on the average signal between left and right. Now, there are some potential benefits here. One of them is you tend to get a really cohesive, constant center image when you have linked stereo compressors. If your left and right are linked together, they're always compressing together. And in ways, this can sound potentially a little bit smoother, some would argue, but for me, the biggest difference is just how much more solid centered elements feel. Now, there are some potential drawbacks here. Say you have a really loud element coming in the left speaker only. Both your left and right are going to be compressed together if they're 100% linked when that loud element comes in on the left-hand side. So instead of just compressing that left element and leaving the right side alone, we're compressing both the left and right, uh, right when something loud is happening on the left, but not on the right. And sometimes your stereo image can suffer a little bit for this. But your center image tends to work really well. 
The opposite is true when you go into dual mono mode and you unlink the left and right sides. So if the compressor is on the left and right sides of your mix bus or your drum bus or your background vocal bus, if they are unlinked, then when something gets really loud on the left-hand side, only the left side is going to get compressed and the right side can stay uncompressed. And this is cool. And to me, I often get a bigger sense of width out of this kind of dual mono type of compression where I can still hear the details on the right side when the left side was getting too loud and it starts getting compressed. And now some of those quiet details on the right side that we're, we're getting lost because we're getting distracted from them, those are allowed to come up. And because it makes that stereo image more co cohesive and the stereo image, like you don't have it tilting too far to one side and the other, the stereo image kind of stays balanced. The difference between left and right and it has this effect of drawing my ears outwards from the center a little bit. So I feel like things start to get a little bit wider feeling. And also this kind of dual mono compression works great when you have mixes that are have, have a ton of hard panning in them. Think like an old 1960s Beatles style mix where like the drum kit is on the left hand side and the vocal and on the right hand side are like all of the guitars. And this happens sometimes in like old school mixes. And if you ever listen to one of these at a bar, it's always funny because you might be right under Paul McCartney in a tambourine. It's like, where's the rest of the band? And then you run down to the other end of the bar where the, <laughs> the other speaker is. And it's like, oh, there's the rest of the band. And some people to this day still go for that kind of retro style of panning. So if you wanted to use bus compression on that kind of mix or mastering compression or limiting on that kind of mix, then generally totally independent left and right make more sense. But there is this negative byproduct of having totally disconnected left and right channels. And that is, if just the left channel is compressing, then your kick drum, your vocal, your bass, all the center stuff, when just the left channel is compressing harder than the right channel, they all get pulled down slightly on the left compared to the right. And it's subtle, especially if you're doing 1 and 2 dB of compression, but there's just this little thing where the center of the record is just changing, it's shifting between left and right. So it has this effect of like the kick snare bass, they're a little, I don't want to say warbly, but they almost the center image drifts a little bit. Like there isn't this super cohesive center. And that is why you might want to link your compressors back together. Now, can't we have the best of both worlds though? Why do we have to have all these trade-offs? And the answer is, man, there is nothing but trade-offs in the world of audio and in life in general. It's like there's no solutions even, and just in life, there are trade-offs. But we can balance these trade-offs. I'll go back to uh, the screen share here for a second. And here you can see the way to balance these trade-offs to some degree is with variable linking controls, like you see on this limiter, and like you see on a very small number of compressors, like this Lindell compressor. Each of these bands has its own variable link control, where they can be not linked at all, and then linked anywhere from 50 to 100%. Now, I said I had nine for you, but this makes me realize I should insert right here a tenth item. So we move on to number four here. I'm going to change this list to be 10. Because I want to talk about something that, man, I've done a whole episode on this before, but I want to give you the broad strokes way to handle this next control, which I think is super useful in mastering and potentially in the mix bus stage. And then after that, for number five, we are going to get into one of my favorite weird controls on compressors that I think every compressor should have. It's like the most fun control and just a handful of compressors have it. And if you don't have a compressor that does this, you're going to want one after I've talked about it because it's a lot of fun. Before I get to these next things, including my favorite missing control, number five, or my favorite weird control, number five, I have to give the briefest, briefest of shout outs to the sponsors on this week's episode. And the most important sponsors on this week's episode are the most important sponsors always. And that most important sponsor is you. How do you sponsor this podcast? Well, you can hit likes, put comments in there, 
hit subscribe. All that stuff really helps spread the word and gets this in front of more people and helps other people have breakthroughs too. If you really want to go deep in sponsoring this stuff though, I recommend you sponsor yourself. Check out one of our great full-length courses like Mixing Breakthroughs or Mastering Demystified. Mixing Breakthroughs is a complete system to mixing that will teach you to mix faster, better, with more confidence and more creativity than ever before. And in Mastering Demystified, I'll tell you everything that I know about mastering. But the most relevant one for you today, if you're really enjoying geeking out on today's subject, is probably compression breakthroughs, where you will learn to finally hear, understand, and use compression like a pro. We go into hours of both ear training exercises that are going to help you really finally hear the subtleties in different compression settings. And we're going to give you a strategy and a set of roadmaps for how to apply compression to every single instrument in every single genre with a ton of audio examples in each. For those of you who say, Justin, how come there's not more audio examples in the podcast? It's A, because it's a podcast, and B, because I want to make the audio examples really, really good and really, really helpful, and that takes time. So they're in the courses. I also have a whole bunch of free videos here with a bunch of free audio examples. And in every single description down below, you'll see a link to a playlist. There's nothing but YouTube videos where I give you audio examples. So if you want some of that, instead of saying, Justin, why don't you do audio examples? Click some of the stuff in that uh, playlist and you will dig it. The last way to sponsor the podcast is to sponsor it in the way that some of the people writing in the chat box right now have sponsored it. People like Ant-Man Felix, Skeleton Pete, Benj, Music 7 Studios, we've got a whole bunch of members of the Sonic Scoop YouTube channel right here inside the chat, chatting away. And those people who are members of the Sonic Scoop YouTube channel are getting one of the best deals in the world of audio. It is like the price of a cup of coffee per month. Buy me one coffee per month and I will give you everything. Um, what I will give you is access to live Q&As with me where you get guaranteed answers to your questions. And we have these mixed feedback sessions where we'll listen to your music together. And I can give you not only constructive criticism, but specific concrete ideas about what you can do in your mixes to take them from where they are now to the next step. And I mean really concrete stuff like, hey man, your kick drum needs more 3K in it. Like, We'll get that granular into your mixes in these mix feedback and mix critique sessions. You're going to love them. If you want to go deep and you don't want to spend a ton of money on one-on-one -on -one consultations or mastering sessions with written feedback, which are things that I do, that aspect of the membership is totally awesome. Um, we're building a great community there. And next week's live stream is going to be a members-only live stream. And then in uh, March, which is coming up soon, we're having our next mix coaching mix critique session. And last thing I'll tell you is you get access to a whole bunch of free videos as part of that membership. There's a whole bunch of videos that are not available on YouTube for the general public, but they're available for members. And these are some of my favorite videos where we go super nerdy, super deep, super esoteric for those of you who really want to get a handle on the business of making records, of being a studio person, of being a musician, or want to go super nerdy on some of the technical stuff, even deeper than we are today. To become a member, just click the join button on the bottom of any YouTube video on this entire channel. Or if you can't see a join button, it's probably because you're on an Apple or iOS device like um, iPhone or an iPad. And for whatever reason, Apple iOS devices, you can't become a member there. So just go to a desktop or go to the browser on your Apple device visit the Sonic Scoop YouTube channel there and you should see a join button where you can become a member. I hope you become a member. All right, with that out of the way, the last things I want to give you are totally free before we get back into the rest of the episode. Free stuff. Number one, we are giving away a hardware compressor that sells for more than $1,500. It's called the Sidechain One. It's from a company called uh, Rock Rupal and Mastering Works. Check that out right now at sonicscoop.com slash contest. That's sonicscoop.com slash contest where you can enter to win one of those for free. As I get better at these live streams, I should probably increase more visual aids for those of you on the video version. I could have opened up like a sexy picture of that as I'm talking. Man, just realizing I should do even more pre-production on these to make these even sexier for you. Do you want even more sexy visual aids in the video version of this podcast? Let me know in the chats. Let me know in the comments. Or is just a giant talking head your cup of tea? 
Okay, uh, next free thing I want to give you, GPU Audio, sponsoring this podcast for a while now. They are giving away a free convolution reverb for, the, for those of you on Mac and for those of you on PC. You get not only the free convolution reverb, but a whole suite of modulation effects. Check them out, gpu.audio slash sonic scoop. That's gpu.audio slash sonic scoop. Link for them should be in the description down below, as well as Sound Toys, makers of some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days at soundtoys.com. All right. Let's get into our next item here, which is mid side compression. And this is a feature you find only on some compressors. Why would you want to go into mid side mode? And I'll also talk about our linking control in the context of mid-side. Here's the deal. Mid-side compression probably doesn't matter for you at the mixing stage. You do not need to use mid-side compression at the mixing stage at all. There are some rare exceptions to that. Maybe you'd use mid-side compression on stereo loops in the mix where you want to have separate control over the center compared to the sides. And their mid-side compression might make some sense. But in general, you're not going to use mid-side compression in the mix because you have an even more powerful tool. It's called the pan knob and the volume fader. So usually when you're compressing, even compressing the mix bus in a mixing situation, most people will set their mix bus compression to either totally stereo linked mix bus compression. I'd say that's the norm. Or these days, now that variable linking is available, they might do slightly stereo unlinked. But as you get into mastering, this is where I think mid side compression becomes more useful. And this is, man, some of this hard panned material is kind of out of control compared to the center. There are these hard panned acoustic guitars, and I wish that in the mix they had used a faster attack compression on these hard panned acoustic guitars. Because, pro tip to you guys, one of the most under compressed instruments I hear in beginning mixes is acoustic guitar, particularly hard panned acoustic guitars, where all these transients are coming through. They're using some type of slower attack compressor or softer knee compressor, and all the initial transients on these acoustic guitars are coming through uncompressed. But on most of your favorite records, that are relatively dense mixes, they're going to be fast attack compression, smoothing out the transients of these acoustic guitars a little bit. And say whoever mixed this record didn't do enough of that. I might want to have a faster attack compressor on the sides to tame the transients of those under compressed acoustic guitars. Just a little bit of extra fast attack dynamic control on the sides, but I don't want to apply that in the center. I don't want to smear the transients in the center. All that stuff's working well. Just want to soften out the sides. Or you might use a multiband compressor or a de-esser in mid-side mode because there are some sibilant background vocals where there's just, or some really bright cymbals that are hard panned, where you just want to soften the top end on those a little bit. So now you might again want to compress or treat the sides separately from the center. Or it could be the other way around, where you have a voice, a vocal, that has sibilance on it. But you don't want to take away the sparkle from the sides, but you do want to compress or DS or tighten up some of the stuff in the center, now you might use your compressor or DS or a multiband compressor in a mid-side mode so you can compress the center differently than the sides. Or you might have some low frequency stuff going on, some hard pan toms where there's this tom that jumps out at uh, 100 hertz on one side. And you might use mid-side compression to put some extra low frequency compression in the sides that isn't in the center. Now, generally speaking, when you use mid-side compression, you are usually going to do this 100% unlinked. It almost doesn't make sense to go into mid-side mode and use completely linked compression because it's like now everything's being compressed just like it was a stereo link compressor. Why, why do you switch it to mid-side? It's just both sides are being compressed. The mids and the sides are basically being compressed the same way. Why did you go into mid-side mode? So usually mid-side compression happens in an unlinked way, whether that's 100% unlinked or maybe uh, some proportion of unlinked. I think you get the most benefits from being completely unlinked or maybe in some cases where you want to dial back some of the contrast you've created 
partially unlinked. But that's the general idea with both mid-side compression and how to link mid-side compression. Now, with that, we have gone through all that I want to tell you about mid-side and linking. I'm going to open up my screen again here, and I'm going to show you yet a different kind of compressor for those of you in the video version. But again, if you're listening to audio, I'm going to make this super easy for you to understand, even if you're not seeing a thing. The next idea here is a type of control that I wish was on every compressor out there, because it's so much fun. The first compressor I ever saw this on was on a hardware Alicia M presser over at Strange Weather Studios in Brooklyn. Shout out to Mark Allen Goodman and Daniel James Schlett. I was there the day that Mark unboxed it and tried it out for the first time. This is my memory, at least. I hope all of what I'm saying is true. No, man, maybe that was a Senator compressor I heard for the first time there. This might have been a Joel Hamilton's play, Studio G. Ah, can't remember. It was one of those guys in Brooklyn. I remember being there for the first time. They were trying out this new compressor and had this control I'd never seen before, a GR limit control, gain reduction limit. This is a super cool control. And basically what it does is it allows you to set the maximum amount of gain reduction that is going to occur. This would not uh, make any difference on a snare sample like I have pulled up here because it's the same sample every time. So it's going to compress by the same amount every single time. So doesn't make any sense here. However, on something that has wildly varying dynamics, a live drum kit, a bass part, you could dial this gain reduction limit control in so you can say, okay, at most I want this compressor to only ever compress by 4 dB. And if it's supposed to compress by more than 4 dB based on the ratio and threshold settings that I have here, it's not going to. I am limiting it to only ever compressing by 4 dB at the most. Now, I think that this is the most fun when you use it at more extreme settings. When you're really smashing something, you're really setting this a threshold low, you're really setting this attack time fast, you're smashing the heck out of your signal. But then you say, okay, I only ever wanted to compress by 12 dB. I know that sometimes it's going to compress by 20 dB or uh, sometimes it'll compress by uh, 25 dB and sometimes it'll compress by 18. It's like, you know what? We're just going to keep it at 12 dB or keep it at 14 dB. So it's always compressing by the same amount at maximum. So you kind of, even with heavy compression, put some of the microdynamics back into the track by saying it's never going to compress more than this amount. And playing around with this, I think this was one of the controls that for the first time I was like, wow, here's a new control that's been added to a compressor that's kind of weird where I can really hear a stark difference in applying more of it versus less of it. I don't know how many compressors are out there with one of these. I've seen it on maybe three different plugins that I can think of. The first one I ever saw it on was this Alicia Impressor. Let me know in the comments or the chat box if you can think of more compressors that had this kind of gain reduction limit control in them. Uh, this is the first I've ever, ever experienced and therefore my favorite. And uh, I'm a big fan of this control in the Alicia. So check that one out. You can try that one out for free. Uh, that one's a Plugin Alliance one. Uh, so you can go over to their website and get a trial of that if you want to play around with what one of those controls are like. But if anyone else wants to mention in the comments or the chat box other compressors they've seen with this control, have at it. All right. Our next two are really closely related to one another. Number six is a key input for a compressor. And a key input you will see this on a lot of compressors. And some DAWs are going to have this basically baked in. Let me uh, bring one of these up on screen for those of you who are on the video version. Right here, I have key input built into Pro Tools for any of my compressors. And I can set the key input to be an input on my interface or my bus. Now, on one of my sidechain videos recently, someone commented, I always hear people talking about how to use a key input, how to sidechain your bass to your kick, that kind of thing. But no one ever shows you how to do it. They probably don't show you how to do it because it's super duper simple. 
And I will right now, for those of you who have Pro Tools, show you the way it's done in Pro Tools. And if you are on some other DAW, the process is going to be almost identical. It's almost identical to this in Logic. And my guess is that in Studio One and Reaper, it's pretty darn close. Maybe Ableton, it's slightly different. Um, but all DAWs have this functionality. Before I show you how key input works, for those of you who don't understand the idea of a key input, we'll talk about it real quick. The most obvious example from back in the day, and I think this is why the key inputs were designed on compressors, is to have something like dialogue automatically bring down a backing music track. So imagine that we're going to use a really fast attack, really slow release compressor that has like a second or two release. So that whenever someone's talking, the music gets compressed. So the compressor hears a voice talking and it's like, oh, someone's talking. There's something in the detector circuit. It's time to start compressing. But what it is applying the compressor to is not the key input, the vocal. It's this other element, in this case, a music bed. So narrator comes on, starts talking, and immediately the music bed gets compressed and held down while that person's talking. And then after they stop talking for a second or two with that really slow release, it comes back up. That is the idea of a key input. But that's one of the less creative ways to use it. The more creative ways to use a key input that you hear talked about in music production today are that you are going to take something like a sustaining low bass line and compress that sustaining low bass line based on what the kick drum is doing. So the kick drum is going to feed into the compressor's detector circuit. So whenever the kick drum hits, it's telling the compressor, compress. But the thing that's getting compressed isn't the kick drum. It's this other element, the bass. So it's almost letting that kick punch a hole through the bass. Every time the kick hits, the bass gets sucked down. So now the kick can come in and be heard even more clearly on top of that bass. And it might be multiple elements. It might not just be the bass that you want to do this to. You might want to have every time the kick hits, the bass sucked down and a whole bunch of your synth pads sucked down. Sometimes you hear this used to really extreme effect in some EDM records, where there's almost like this seasicky heaving feeling, like every time the kick drum hits, like the whole rest of the mix pulls down. And that can happen if you get really dramatic with it, and some people do that intentionally. There's one track on this uh, album I did for Brother Tiger, uh, great band, great album, I think it was called Out of Touch, I did from several years back. And uh, he had one track that was like that, really kind of moving back and forth. And I remember it was one of the first uses of really super intentional, super overdone sidechain compression for an effect. And I've heard it more times since then, but uh, I remember the way he did it just had this really interesting feel. I don't want to say, I was almost going to say nauseating in the best way, but like you can't be nauseous in a good way, unsettling in the best possible way. But this can be used really subtly. I used to use a gentler version of this kind of trick in my mixing days quite a bit with things like snare drum or occasionally with vocals. Rather than just EQing a spot in a whole bunch of guitars for a snare drum to poke through, having those guitars side chain to the snare. So the snare hits, the guitars get pulled down ever so slightly just when the snare is hitting, so it really brings the snare forward more. Similar things with vocals over a synth pad that was occupying some of the same area. And as the vocal line comes in, it just naturally pulls down that synth pad. Now, to set this up is really simple. I have on this first track here, um, this compressor on it. And in Pro Tools, I could set a key input to say bus one. And now I could take my second track here and have it send out to bus one. And now I have this send knob where I can control how much is being fed to bus one. We'll just put it at unity gain. And now any of the signal from channel two is going into bus one and that bus one is the key input for this track one. So my first track is now receiving signal on its compressor for the second track. What's triggering the compressor on track one is the output of track two. I hope that makes some sense to you. We could go 
even deeper on this, and I could repeat this example multiple times, but if you get confused at all and you want to know how to do it in your DAW, just rewatch that section. I brought up a compressor on track one. I go over here, set its key input to be bus one, and whatever track I want to have trigger it, I just make sure it's sending some signal out to bus one. In this case, I'm doing it as an aux send, so the track gets out to my main outputs, but also the track in, additional, through, uh, in addition through an aux goes to bus one. So I hope that makes some sense to you. That is the idea of a key input for a sidechain. But this is not the only use of the sidechain or the most important use of the sidechain. A sidechain really gives us frequency-dependent compression. And a sidechain filter will often be built into a lot of modern compressors, although not all, all of them. So see here on the stock Pro Tools compressor plugin, we have this side uh, chain circuit. And we can turn on a low pass filter and a high pass filter. So we can make it so that this compressor just reacts to mid frequencies. So say we have a mix and we want to react the compressor on the mix bus to react more to the snare than to other elements. Or on the drum bus, we want the compressor to react more to an overabundant kick drum on, say, a, uh, a stereo loop that we have. We can't go in there and remix the thing, but we want to turn down the kick drum. Then we could just focus it on low frequencies. And now only frequencies below 200 hertz are triggering the compressor. So when the kick drum hits, it'll trigger the compressor, but not when everything else hits. So it's almost like we can duck down the drum slightly, but only when the kick is hitting. On a standard compressor, this is not going to be uh, frequency-specific compression. It's going to be frequency-dependent compression. Meaning how much we compress depends on the frequency. But we're not just compressing that specific frequency. We're compressing broadband based on what's happening in a specific frequency. So that's what the sidechain lets you do. Apply broadband compression but we're making it react more or less to specific areas. If it was also frequency specific, meaning it was only compressing that frequency range, well, that's basically one band of a multi-band compressor. Related but slightly different concept. And if you want to think of a device that's basically like one band of a multi-band compressor, you've got it in a de-esser. A de-esser will often act just like this. It might allow you to adjust the side chain of the compressor so that it's just picking up on sibilant areas, S's and T's, maybe somewhere between 6K and 10K. You set exactly the right side chain, so it's only compressing those. And it might have a broadband operation where when an S or a T comes through, it compresses everything. And you might be able to put in a split band mode where it only compresses those frequencies that are triggering. So that would be a de-esser. And they're usually going to have a really, really fast attack time and really fast release time to really catch those S's and T's. But you'll find these sidechain filters built into most compressors to varying degrees. Um, there's another one here. Let me see if I can find... Um, you know what? There's a really cool compressor, another Plugin Alliance one, called the BX Opto. And this one, just like the Smack compressor that's built into Pro Tools, has a few different sidechain shapes built in. So the simplest kind of sidechain EQ you'll find on a compressor is one that allows you to filter out just low frequencies. And that's probably the most common use of a sidechain EQ. You're compressing a mix bus or you're compressing a drum bus, and you don't want that mix bus compressor or that drum bus compressor just reacting to the highest energy, low frequency elements. So you might exclude some low frequencies from triggering the compressor. And that's probably the most common number one way that people use side chains. Saying, hey, I've got a mix bus compressor on here, but there's so much energy in my kick and bass, that the only thing triggering my mix bus compressor. That's dumb. I want it responding to things like vocals and snare drums and guitars. How do I do that? I don't want to turn down my bass and my kick. I like how much low end there is in this record. Well, you throw a compressor on there, but you take out some of the low frequencies with your side chain, and now it's not overreacting to, say, frequencies below 60 hertz or 80 hertz or 100 hertz. 
So now you're able to bring the threshold down lower and the compressor is actually going to react to that lower energy, mid and high frequency content, like snare drums, like vocals, like guitars that you really want to dig into. You'll see on this uh, Brainworks uh, BX Opto compressor, there's a couple of different filters here. By default, there's a low cut in the side chain. You can turn the side chain on and there's a low cut option, there's a high cut option, and then there are two different options where you're just compressing mids. So this is probably way number two that a lot of people are going to use these simple sidechain filters is on an element that has slightly aggressive, annoying mid frequencies. Maybe there's a vocal that just pushes out too much or gets too pinched in this one area of the mids and just one K is a little too strident and you just want to do some extra compression when there's a lot of one K happening, but you don't want to suck out a lot of one K with EQ. A sidechain compressor, uh, compressor can do exactly that by allowing you to focus in doing more compression just in that middle area and less compression everywhere else. So that can be a super useful reason to use sidechain. Man, you guys, we've come so far. We're about 55 minutes in to this podcast. We're getting close to the hour mark. Do you think I can go through the last three types in the last five minutes that we have left? I think we do. I think we can. I think I can do it. All right, number eight I've got for you is something that's totally weird and that you're only gonna find on one compressor I've ever seen, and I had to bring this one up because I just did a video on it on the Plugin Alliance channel not too long ago, and this was on the Amec Mastering Compressor. And since we're not on the Plugin Alliance channel, I can tell you guys the big secret of what this is modeled after. Um, this is a compressor that's in the style of the GML compressors uh, designed by George Massenberg. This is not a promotional piece for this compressor, but that's the, like the heritage of this. And Massenberg is a brilliant designer, basically invented the parametric EQ. He's one of the co-creators of it. Made some gorgeous sounding compressors. And he had this really interesting take with some of the compressors he designed where he was like, man, what if we could kind of have three compressors in one? We could have a slow compression detector circuit a fast compression detector circuit and a kind of peak compression detector circuit, almost a limiter, all in the same compressor. And what's basically going to happen with this kind of compressor is I can turn up the threshold and we'll be hitting the slow averaging compressor, compressor maybe more of a, you know, opto LA2A slowish attack, slowish release kind of compressor. But often people will chain that together with a faster attack compressor. So you have this fast crest factor you can introduce. So now you're also having this fast detector circuit that's detecting not the immediate peaks, but it's almost a little bit more like an 1176 kind of detection where things are a little bit faster. And then you have this momentary peak detection kind of circuit. And you can do a little bit of all three of them. So really interesting type of design. But there's this funny interaction on this one weird esoteric type of compressor that, to my knowledge, is now available for the first time ever in digital form. I've never seen this layout before in digital form. But it was a really cool thing on these compressors. They had this knob called Release Hysteresis. And this is the only compressor you're ever going to see this weird knob on. This is the geekiest we're going to get in this whole episode. For those of you who are interested in the old Massenberg style compressors or the new Amic Mastering compressor that I had the privilege of playing around with and doing a video on, and you really want to understand how the release hysteresis control works, I'm going to give you now the extra nerdy information that I did not even do in my like video manual and walkthrough for this compressor. The idea with this, for those nerds who are still left with me is that when you have the slow attack compressor and the fast attack compressor both working together, you're generally going to have the attack and release profile, maybe a little bit, particularly the release profile, more dominated by what's happening with the slow attack compressor. But this release hysteresis knob basically lets us put in a second threshold. So I'll see if I can explain as clearly as possible. We've got a threshold here and we can feed some of our slow detection into this compressor, 
into this threshold to trigger the compressor. We can also feed in our fast attack detector circuit into this threshold. Because that slow detection circuit stays active for longer, the release is usually dominated by whatever's happening in the slow detection circuit. But this release hysteresis basically under the hood allows us to put in a second threshold. And it says above this second threshold, only pay attention to the fast attack compressor or predominantly pay attention to the fast attack detection circuit. So for signals that get above this secondary higher threshold, we're basically going to have really, really fast attack and release times. And under this primary one, maybe it's dominated a little bit more by the slow averaging compressor. So let's boil it down and make it super simple. This release hysteresis control is a little bit like having two different thresholds. When signal gets above threshold number one, the compression characteristics are dominated a little bit more by our slower, more averaging, macrodynamic compressor circuit. When signals get above this second, higher threshold, signals above there are going to basically pay more attention to what's going on in our fast compression detector circuit. So really hot signals will get a dose of really fast compression on them. Things that get above both threshold number one and threshold number two will have even faster compression applied to what's over threshold number two. Where below that point, we're paying a little bit more attention to the slow detector circuit. And this is kind of like how stacking compressors works in real life. When you stack a slow compressor with a fast compressor, which is one of the biggest reasons you'd use multiple compressors on the same source, is so you can blend together a faster attack compressor with a slower attack compressor and getting the benefits of each of their trade-offs. So that is the super weird, super esoteric release hysteresis control that's only ever been on one compressor ever. And if we're going that deep, you know we're near the end of this list. Because it doesn't get much more weird and esoteric than that. There's one other type of control I'm actually going to add to this list. I told you in the beginning this is going to be a list of eight, and there was going to be a list of nine, but now it's going to be a list of ten because I just realized there's one other esoteric control you'll see on some but not all compressors. I've seen a couple of stock compressors that have this where there's not only a release control, but also a hold control. Man, the hold control is a little bit like the release control. You'll see a hold control, a whole bunch on things like expanders and gates. And we'd have to do a whole separate video about expanders and gates to talk about their idiosyncrasies. But if you want to understand how the hold control works, it's, it's kind of simple. It's like, you can think of it as being like a delay before the release even kicks in. Like a minimum release time for that compressor. The compressor kicks in, and rather than going straight to the release, it gets held and being sucked down for however long it says on your hold knob. And then, once you've, it's been held for that long, then it gets released, just as your release control says that it should. There's only a couple of compressors I've ever seen that have a hold function on them, but you will see them often on things like downward expanders and gates, like noise gates, things like that. So man, that's number nine now. And now our last one, number 10, last weird control that you don't learn about in the basic compressor videos that I can think of is going to be our true peak control on a limiter. You generally don't find these on compressors. You generally find them only on limiters, the true peak button. What does it do? Why do we need it? How does it change the sound? All right, do we have time for this? We're an hour and five minutes in. Guys, what do you think? Should we keep on going? Should we get through true peak limiting? I think I can give you the short version of this. Maybe we'll do an hour and 10 minute live stream podcast. You know, I go in planning to do these for 30 minutes and then an hour of words just come out of my mouth. 
And if I ever try to go in there, say if they're going to be an hour long, you know they're going to be 90 minutes or, or, or two hours. All right, let's try to do it. True peak. Why would you use this? I would say the only reason you're ever going to use True Peak is going to be in a mastering context. You guys should be seeing my Pro Tools screen right now. Let me know if you are. After an hour of talking, I can get a little discombobulated, but I think you should be seeing my Pro Tools screen. The only reason you'd enable True Peak on your limiter is as the very final item in a mastering context. Otherwise, I'd recommend that you leave them off. The idea here is that there are the peaks that you see on conventional meters, but then there are real peaks that conventional digital meters don't pick up on. And to pick up on them, you need a True Peak meter. The idea is that there can be peaks that happen in between samples at whatever your sampling rate is. To make this make sense, for those of you who don't understand yet this concept of true peaks and intersample peaks, we're just going to have to go down the basics of digital audio real quick. And I encapsulate this in about 90 seconds or two minutes. I think I can do it. Here's how digital audio works in a nutshell. We have continuous audio, the analog world, infinite resolution, right? Digital doesn't work that way. Digital is binary, ons and offs. So what we do is we take this infinite resolution of the analog world and say, you know what? Most frequencies are not relevant to us in that we cannot hear radio frequencies, right? We cannot hear so many frequencies in like the cell phone range with our ears. There are so many frequencies that we're constantly being bombarded with that we cannot hear. Let's cut all of them out. And let's just focus in on the range of human hearing. Commonly accepted as 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Reality for most of you people who live in Western countries with you know, noise pollution, been to rock concerts and stuff like that before, chances are you can't hear to 20K, particularly if you're above 30. Maybe if you're 18, you can still hear 20K and maybe even slightly higher than that. Or maybe if you spend your entire life living in a remote tribe in the uh, Amazon rainforest, then maybe you can still hear 20K or even slightly above that. Maybe you've been hunting uh, antelope for your entire life in the African Serengeti and you're one of like these few people on earth who hasn't been bombarded with the same environmental stimulus we have and you can hear 21K. But most of us, adults in like developed nations, man, you're 35, you're lucky if you're hearing 16K. But I digress. 20 to 20,000. We're cutting out everything else above and below it. Really above when it comes to the sampling rate, but don't make me digress more because I'll do it. So we take all of our frequencies up to 20K. We cut off stuff up above 20K and we take digital snapshots of the audio. How many? Enough to perfectly record and play back up to 20 kilohertz. Tw sorry, 20, yeah, 20 kilohertz, 20,000 hertz, which basically means something more than 40,000 hertz. So we need a sampling rate, snapshots of at least 40,000 or more snapshots per second to perfectly play back 20K minus some noise that gets added because of the bit depth. That's a whole other conversation. So we're taking 40,000 snapshots or more in a second of that audio. So we've got a point here, a point here, a point here, a point here, all these snapshots. But when we play back that digital audio, we're not playing back snapshots. It becomes analog audio. And the stuff in between each of those snapshots gets filled in perfectly because there's a line that's suggested by where those two points are. If I have one point here and one point here, it's not like the analog waveform becomes like a jagged straight line between the two. It's like, no, there's this continuity of what's going on and we recreate perfectly round looking sine waves with these digital snapshots.
We don't actually get stair-stepping or jagged lines. That does not happen with digital audio. What happens is between two points, say two points of the same amplitude, based on the trajectory of the audio, it's suggested that what's going to happen is a little bit of a hump here in between these two points, which we have not captured a snapshot for. There's an increase in amplitude happening between any two samples in some cases, and that increase in amplitude between any two samples can go above digital zero and potentially cause distortion. It's what's called an inter-sample peak, a peak in your audio waveform that happens in between two samples. So what do we got to do? If we're mastering records and we don't want a whole bunch of distortion to be created when we're mastering a really hot record that's going to go up in a streaming service, we want to make sure that we don't have excessive intersample peaks. If you have regular 3 dB worth of intersample peaks on your record, you probably will get some distortion when you go through some of these MP3 and streaming codecs. I've only had this happen to me in 10 years of mastering. It's happened twice that I've heard a record through a codec and I'm like, there's additional distortion on it that shouldn't be there. And the solution was, before these types of true peak limiters were invented, the solution was simply turn down the output slightly. And if you turn down the output by half a dB, so you're not going all the way up to digital zero, or maybe in some cases more than that, by 0.8 dB, or even as much as turning it down by 1 dB, the final output, that would stop these intersample peaks that aren't showing up in the meters from being so hot that they cause distortion for final end consumers once they're going through these final codecs and the final audio playback. But there's a hack, and the hack is this, a true peak limiter. You hit the true peak button, and now you don't necessarily have to turn down the final output from your limiter at least you don't have to turn it down as much. Because now all those intersample peaks, the peaks in between your samples, are also being limited. So you're getting rid of your intersample peaks. And this helps make it so that you can get slightly hotter masters with slightly less distortion, or not run into those rare cases where you get unexpected distortion upon playing things back on a streaming service or on an mp3 and a final consumer system. And you can possibly eke out now that last little half dB of gain instead of turning down your output by, you know, negative 0.8 or negative 1 or negative 0.5 or whatever you're comfortable with doing. You don't have to turn down the output that much. When I use a true peak limiter and engage one, I'll often set the ceiling at negative 0.1 and there aren't intersample peaks that I've discovered that can cause distortion. That way I haven't run into it. I test it all the time and I might not even really need to turn down the output at all, but just partly out of superstition and partly because I haven't done enough testing, I've been turning down my output ceiling by just negative 0.1 when I enable a true peak limiter. And I look at them on true peak meters and see like, yeah, there's no intersample peaks there. We're good. Now, why not use true peak limiters all the time? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is that you don't want to use them on every single source in the mix because they do require oversampling, which requires a slightly higher CPU load than having the true peak limiter off. And some people think they don't sound as good as regular limiters. The difference in sound is slight, but I can understand. I would say with this particular one I have pulled up, the ozone limiter, it does sound a little bit edgier to me and a little bit harsher to me in true peak mode than it does in its regular mode. Um, I would like the true peak modes a little bit more on the fab filter limiter. I feel like I can do a little bit more with that one and not hear as much of a change in tone. So sometimes if I want to use the ozone limiter, because I really love the sound of the ozone limiter on a particular record, I'll put the fab filter limiter after it just to catch the true peaks. Uh, also, the uh, the Plugin Alliance Brainworks uh, BX Limiter True Peak is another one of the best sounding ones I've heard, and sometimes I'll use that one in isolation. It only has a True Peak mode, and its True Peak mode sounds great, and I'll use that one just by itself. 
But one of the things I do in mastering, because I'm a total nerd, is I one of the very first things I do is try out a bunch of different limiters on the record, see which limiter sounds best on it for increasing it to the level we want it to be at. And then I go backwards from there and apply my EQs and other things. But I want to first get on a limiter that complements how the record already sounds. So I try like four or five different limiters and geek out about the tiny little differences in tone between each of them, which is super nerdy. But hopefully you appreciate that your mastering engineer is doing that for you because uh, I enjoy doing it and I can either hear the difference or have fooled myself into thinking that I can. Dudes, dudettes, hombres. That's nine things. Our tenth thing was going to be type of compressor. Some compressors let you change between opto, FET, VCA, etc., vary mu. But I wasn't going to talk about that number 10 thing, which is now the number 11 thing, in this week's episode of the podcast. You know why? Because I just did a video all about that over on the Plugin Alliance channel. And if you want to know about the differences between different types of compressors, you can go and check out a free video I just did on the Plugin Alliance channel called Choosing Your Compressor. If you want the super duper deep version of that, where you get to hear a ton of audio examples and where I go into even greater depth and detail with even more preparation for you guys, then the full-length course, Compression Breakthroughs, gives you the best shot I will ever have at helping you hear and understand the differences between different types of compressors. You can check that one out, compressionbreakthroughs.com. comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. We've today spent all this time talking about nerdy, esoteric things about compression that will, in some cases, help you change the way your compressors sound a little bit. Why have we spent so much time talking about something that's so subtle? Basically, everything on this list that we've talked about introduce relatively subtle changes in your compression that you shouldn't be obsessed about. But here's the thing. I don't want you to feel intimidated by audio or feel intimidated by your compressors. All of this stuff is really simple and easy to understand. We've covered knee. You know what that is now. If you don't, Go back and watch the first section on this. I'll try to put timestamps in. We talked about feedback versus feed forward. If you see that, you can understand what it means now and not have to second guess yourself or feel dumb or feel inexperienced. You now have a sense for like why a link control is even there and why you'd set it to completely linked or not. You've got a sense for why people would even use mid-side compression with some real examples. Gain reduction limit is a fun one. I hope you try out some compressors that have it in there. How to use and why to use both a key input to your sidechain and sidechain EQ. If you want to get super nerdy and you want to geek out with the big compressor geniuses, you can tell them you understand how release hysteresis works. Man, I just gave you what I think is, on record, the best explanation I have ever seen or heard of release hysteresis, and it's still kind of complicated and hard to understand. I'm serious. Go look up George Massenberg's explanation of what the release hysteresis control does and tell you if you think it's more or less comprehensible than mine. I think mine is at least as good, and hopefully I put it in more layman's terms that make it even more understandable. You don't see a lot of people writing or talking about this because most people feel intimidated by it, and they never really figure out what it does and how it works. But the long story short, short is eternal release history is a snob uh, more and more uh, clockwise, and your release kind of gets faster, potentially, is the effect of it. But now you know what's happening under the hood. Uh, True Peak, we talked about why you need it and when you'd need it and where to apply it. And compressor types, we didn't really do much other than talk about there are different types, but I've got a whole video for you. I'll link to it in the show notes down below. Let me know in the chat right now or in the comments below if any of these moments were eureka moments for you that really stood out to you or are ones that you want to hear again. And I will create a short, tight, edited version of it where I trim out all the fat and you can encounter it out there in the real world as a one-minute short or as a five-minute short, which is trimmed down to its essence and made as clear as possible. I want to do that for you guys. All you got to do is put into the comments or the live chat which moments were the most helpful for you. And if you want to help this podcast, there's so many things you can do. I want to give you guys more, and the best way you can do that is sponsor yourself by checking out one of the courses or consider becoming a member. If you have listened to me talk this long on this episode, it's because you're as nerdy as I am, and for some reason, you don't mind hearing me talk, and when I talk, it seems to make sense to you. So if you want to get any of your questions answered about audio, about mixing, about mastering, about recording, about the business of audio, all things that I study, 
you can check me out on the members side where I will give you guaranteed long form answers to your questions as a member of the Sonic Scoop YouTube channel. We've got a whole bunch of people right now in the chat who are members. We've been adding a member on an average of a member a day the last time I checked. So I hope that you'll become one too, get access to those live Q&As and access to our mixed feedback and mixed coaching sessions. Last but not least, I got some free stuff for you. If you didn't go to sonicscoop.com slash contest before, do it now because this is the last day right now if you're listening to this live where we are giving away a $1,500 plus hardware compressor from Rock Rupal and Mastering Works. It's called the Sidechain One. It is a beautiful, gorgeous hardware compressor that has all sorts of crazy sidechain capabilities that now you know what to do with because you know what sidechains do. Check them out over at uh, sonicscoop.com slash contest. Enter for your chance to win. And free stuff again. GPU audio. If you haven't clicked this link, go for it. Type it in right now because this episode is ending. GPU.audio slash Sonic Scoop. That's GPU.audio slash Sonic Scoop. Click there. Get a free convolution reverb and a free modulation suite that run on the GPU inside your computer. Last but not least, Sound Toys. Making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at SoundToys.com. Man, an hour and 20, we've set a new record in live stream podcast length. What do you guys think of the length? Should I go shorter? Should I stay this long? Do you prefer it when I do really tight edited stuff or do you like to be able to dip into a long live stream where we go super deep, super nerdy and stay superhuman? Because this is what it's like when people talk and they're not just chop, 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 chopped up for you in YouTube. If you have trouble getting through a whole hour-long episode, I recommend you do what I do, which is to listen to these episodes at two times speed. Then they're only half-hour episodes. That's how I listen to all of my videos on YouTube because I'm insane. But um, you might die if you do that because of how fast I talk naturally, so you might want to only um, do it at one and a half times speed. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed hanging out with me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop Podcast. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. See you next time.